Hi, Charles is a Book Sage here, and this is episode 13 of my Harry Potter first time reread series. If this is your first time here, I am in the middle of rereading the Harry Potter series for the first time. I've taken all seven books and broken them up into 52 sections, and every Sunday I read a set of chapters, record my weekly vlog, and upload that on Mondays. I also upload videos on Wednesdays and Fridays for my booktube channel. So please like and subscribe if you're interested in that and just booktube in general. And today I am covering chapters 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which in my original read of the series was my favorite of the seven books. And absolutely loving it this time around. So let's dive into today's content. Chapter 16, Professor Trelawney's Prediction. So it's June, yeah, we're coming up on exam time. Harry, Hermione, and Ron have to take their finals for the year. Fred and George are finally taking their owls. And Percy is taking his newts, because Percy wants to go work for the Ministry of Magic. So he has to not only take the newts, but score really, really well to do them. So there's a lot of pressure for everybody here. Uh, but even still, with all that, still more on Hermione, who they're still shaking their heads, scratching their heads, wondering, how is she going to take two finals at the same day at the same time? And then two more finals on the same day at the same time later on in that same afternoon. So Rowling runs right through the exams. She doesn't really spend much time on them here. She just, they're there, but they're not the important part. The only exam we really get to see anything of is Professor Trelawney's divination final. And she does that one at a time. And Harry, of course, is the last one to go. And second to last was Ron, and on his way out, he told Harry that I just made stuff up. And Harry goes, he's staring into the crystal ball, still can't see anything, starts making stuff up, starts talking about Buckbeak, and how Buckbeak isn't executed, and he gets away, flies away. And Professor Trelawney seems disappointed, because she's sort of hinting at he should see Buckbeak like with his head cut off and blood and all this stuff. Again, I, I love Professor Trelawney. She just is one of my favorite characters in this series, as far as all the professors go. Her and Lupin, I think, are probably my two favorite just teachers. Uh, Lupin for his kindness and care, and Trelawney for her, her theater and all that stuff. She's just, her, her classes, even if you may not be learning anything, they're certainly... Uh, entertaining and almost like a play in a way. But the real interesting part here is just as Harry's getting ready to leave, Professor Trelawney goes into a trance and has an actual real vision. And now we kind of see why she's here at Hogwarts, why Dumbledore picked her of all people, who seems just completely like just all about dramatics and and theater, we learn she actually does possess the power of divination. And it will happen tonight, I think, is how it starts off. And she's saying how the Dark Lord's servant will break out of his chains and come to him and he'll begin his rise again. And um, I remember they did this in the movie. Uh, I don't know if they use the same exact words as in the book, though. I'm going to have to go... Uh, when I watch the movie next time, I'm going to have to have this book with me. I'm just curious to see if they kept the same exact dialogue or changed it. Uh, if you know whether it's the same or not, please let me know in the comments. But the more important part of this chapter really is about Buckbeak. And it's his appeal is happening this last day. The Ministry of Minister of Magic, the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, has shown up with two people from the committee, or one person from the committee and the executioner, which pretty much tells you that the um, appeal process is all for show, that the decision's already been made. And then they find out after all their tests are done that, yes, from Hagrid's letter, that Buckbeak is going to be executed, and for them not to come down, that he doesn't want them seeing any of that, witnessing it. But of course, Hagrid's their friend, so Hermione goes and retrieves the invisibility cloak from the passageway, 
after Harry tells her how to go get it. And Ron is just, like super impressed that Hermione is just like breaking rules and doing all these things. And I liked how Rowling just mentions that Hermione looked extremely flattered. And again, just beginning to build in the the plotting and work towards their eventual relationship. You really see the beginnings of that part of their connection here in this book, as I've mentioned uh, a few times before. But then off to see Hagrid anyway with the invisibility cloak. They get there. Hagrid's a total wreck. He drops the milk pitcher. It shatters, and Hermione says she'll take care of it, and Hermione's just as upset as Hagrid is. And we discover hiding in another pitcher in Hagrid's cupboard is Scabbers. And this is where he's been apparently all this time since Crookshanks attacked him and Ron had only found blood and cat hairs. He's been hiding out here in Hagrid's hut, apparently just keeping out of the way from everybody. But Scabbers is like wild and crazy and even Ron can't control him. But they have to sneak out, sneak out of the back door. And while Dumbledore and them arrive and... As they're leaving and going back to the castle, to the school, Scabbers is just freaking out, trying to bite Ron to try to get away. And they hear the swish of the axe. So they just presume that Buckbeak is dead. And that's pretty much how the chapter ends. A quick chapter. Not a lot happened, just getting through exams. But getting us really to these two big moments here in this chapter, which is Professor Trelawney's actual vision, divination, that... Whatever is going down, it's going down tonight. Which, again, as far as the writing goes and the story goes, it really ratchets up the attention, ratchets up the apprehension and the adrenaline and the reader's attention as well. And, of course, the belief at this point that Buckbeak has been killed, which is not um, a good portent for the Dark Lord getting help and rise, beginning his rise tonight. That something innocent like Buckbeak would be killed, or at least they believe. And that's it. Pretty straightforward chapter. But it was meant to get that plot point across, set up the Buckbeak thing for later. And again, one of my favorite Trelawney moments where we get to see her actually really have visions. So... That part and that faith in Dumbledore and him putting the right people in the right places at the right times. Um, there's some good parts to his manipulation, I suppose. And Trelawney is one of them. So, a good chapter. Chapter 17, Cat, Rat, and Dog. Now, Harry, Hermione, and Ron are still on their way back to Hogwarts, having just left Hagrid, having just assumed Buckbeat's been executed. And... Scabbers is freaking out. Crookshanks pops up. Scabbers finally gets away, bites Ron, runs off. Crookshanks after him. Ron leaves the invisibility cloak and runs after both of the cat and the rat. And Harry and Hermione are forced to chase after him. And they finally catch up to him when Ron has jumped on Scabbard. He's got Scabbard back. And then out of the shadows comes the black dog that Harry has been seeing throughout the entire book. And the dog leaps at Harry, leaps at Ron. Ron break, breaks his leg. And then the dog grabs Ron and just drags him off. And they give chase, following him. And then they arrived at, at this tree just in time to see Ron being dragged into this like sort of opening by the roots down underground. And then they get hammered because it's the Whomping Willow. And they didn't even realize it. And they're stuck because they can't get any closer to go after Ron, because they're going to just get waddled by this tree. And then here comes Crookshanks again, strolls right up to the base of the tree, pops his paw on a root, and the tree stops. And then Harry and Hermione are able to go after them. And they go through this long, long tunnel uh, that was mentioned earlier, Fred and George. Um, that was the only tunnel that was still available that they couldn't get at themselves because of the Whomping Willow. And then they emerge finally in this house, and Hermione figures out that it's the Shrieking Shack. And they follow upstairs, burst into the room, 
only to discover there's Ron uh, on, I think, on the bed in a lot of pain. And then the door closes behind them, and there's Sirius Black in the corner. And we learn then that this hasn't been a dog after all. It's been, he's, it's been Sirius Black is an animagus and can appear as a dog. And a fight ensues. Harry just completely loses it and charges and attacks him and gets Snape down on the ground, disarmed. He's got his wand there, and he has the perfect opportunity to kill him, and he wants to kill him. And this is a critical, critical moment for Harry here in this overall story. This is what kind of separates Harry from Tom, Tom Riddle, from Voldemort. Because in this situation, Voldemort, Tom Riddle, would have been merciless and, and ruthless and would have just killed Black. And Harry wants to. And that's sort of that struggle. And thinking back now, is that just Harry's personality? Is Harry just that similar in some ways to Tom Riddle? That he could go down that path? Or is it the scar and what that whole mean stuff comes to mean later? Is it just that part of Voldemort imprinted on him? So nothing here to indicate which way it goes. I personally think it's just Harry possesses that in himself, that he has the potential to go down that dark path because he's got a lot of similar characteristics, the, the pride the arrogance in many ways. Um, but Harry just turns out to be a better person, at least in this situation here. This is his first real, real test that's going to really send him down a path for a long time. And it's hard to say what he would have done, I mean, he was hesitating enough where it looks like he probably wouldn't have killed Black. But um, we don't know because Lupin bursts into the room, disarms them now, and then he's, like, talking to Black, and he realizes something. Black says something, and you can see something clicks in Lupin's head. And then Lupin realizes what happened and what's been going on. And then he reaches down, pulls Black up, and embraces him. And this is, like, that big moment in the book that the whole misdirect has been leading up to this moment here to make Harry, Hermione, and Ron and the reader um, think that Lupin is a villain too, that Lupin's been lying to them and just been waiting for his moment to betray them all for Sirius. And it's really interesting here how Crookshanks the cat is just determined to protect Sirius Black. Throughout this whole scene, Crookshank has been putting himself in the way, in between the kids and their wands and Sirius Black. So a nice little touch here. and I, I like that. I'm still waiting. I don't remember why Crookshanks has this affinity. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be mentioned in this book at some point. I don't think they really even had that kind of thing in the movie from what I recall but they're all distraught they can't believe it Hermione as well even more so than Harry is feels betrayed because she's kept Lupin's secret and we finally learn what Lupin's secret is because Hermione lets them all know that Lupin is a werewolf and that she had figured it out from the essay Snape made them write when he filled in for the dark defense against the dark arts class when he made them go to the werewolf chapter. And really, one of my favorite reveals here is Lupin figures out where they were because he was looking at the Marauder's map because he had taken it from Harry a few chapters back. And Harry's surprised that, that he even knows how to use it. And we learn Lupin is like, I'm one of the people who wrote it. I'm Mooney. That was my nickname in school when I was going here. I helped create the Marauders map. And we learned also that he saw Sirius Black's name and the invisibility cloak still can't hide you from the map. And he mentions as a second name, second name, second name. And then you start to realize as a reader, 
that you've been missing something and there's somebody else that they're talking about. They're not talking about Sirius Black. There's somebody else here, somebody else in play. And then we get at least not the reveal, but the claim from Lupin and Sirius Black that Scabbers isn't a rat at all, an animagus himself. And that animagus is Peter Pettigrew. And that's how the chapter ends. And just a great chapter. It's just nonstop action in this chapter. And you get hit with so many different things in such a short period of time. And that moment when you first read this for the very first time where Lupin bursts in and then he hugs Black. And then it's like you feel this like betrayal. Now, I didn't have that experience here because, again, I've already read it that one time. I've seen the movie like 20 times. But it's really fun to go back and reread how it plays out here in this, in the book. And really well, again, so well written, this this particular book. And I, I totally forgot Ron had broken his leg. I totally forgot that Crookshanks was... was basically putting his own life you know, on the line to protect uh, Sirius Black here in this chapter. Uh, really well done. And now I'm excited for the next chapter to see what happens next. So chapter 18, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. And now we get Lupin's story of being a werewolf. We learn that he was bitten as a boy, as a young kid, and his parents had feared that he'd never be able to go to Hogwarts, become a proper wizard. Uh, but Dumbledore ended up becoming the headmaster and decided to let Lupin come in. And we learned that Dumbledore planted the Whomping Willow, built the tunnel, and built the Shrieking Shack to have a place for Lupin to go once a month and transform into the werewolf. And all those howls, those ghostly screams and howls that everyone used to hear in the shrieking track, in the shrieking shack, where it, which gave it its namesake, was actually Lupin as a werewolf. Because Lupin would it would just be mad and crazy, and would have no human intelligence as a werewolf, and just even just like hurt himself and scream and everything. What's really interesting is after being unable to hide it anymore from his friends, which were James and Sirius and Peter. They all, upon discovering that he was a werewolf and had to keep doing this every month, taught themselves how to become an animagus. So they each were able to transform into something. It took them a couple of years, but they finally learned how to do it. So then they would transform and then go with him. And being in animal form, the werewolf wasn't going to bother them. And apparently they roamed all over the place while he was a werewolf instead of staying in the Shrieking Shack, which really put a lot of people in jeopardy. And, but Lupin admits as much as he felt guilt about it because he was dishonoring the trust Dumbledore put in him. They were kids, and kids don't think straight. And that we learn that, that Lupin kept the knowledge from Dumbledore that... Severus was an animagus and could have been sneaking into the to the castle as an animal. He kept that from Dumbledore just merely out of from out of pride because then Dumbledore would have realized that Lupin has been dishonest about things with him all this time. And people seem to make bad decisions not wanting to upset Dumbledore. This is kind of the blowback of Dumbledore being so manipulative. And that people are then afraid to, and not because they fear his manipulation, because they don't see the manipulating part of him. They just see the the wizard who's so open and caring and trusting and willing to go out on a limb for them. And they don't see that. They only see that part and not the fact that he's doing it because he can use them to, you know, hold off Voldemort and whatever else he's up to. But it ends up putting people in these positions. Uh, Harry's been in this position before, I think. Or he will be, I know, later in the series. Lupin has found himself in this position where they 
don't give critical information because they don't want to disappoint Dumbledore. So it's a downside of Dumbledore being as good as he is about at manipulating people in that they don't give him information that he could probably need and use. So one of those little interesting things that you see throughout the series from time to time. And it's important to pay attention to because think about that in your own life of how many times do you not say something to somebody because not that they're going to get angry or anything, but that you're, they're going to be disappointed in you. And it's that disappointment in how they're going to view you that you hold your tongue when you should say something that needs to be said to help. So I like that she took time to kind of weave that in there. And you may not really notice it, particularly as a younger kid reading these books. And I don't think I really noticed it the first time around. But again, that's the real benefit here of me doing this nice, slow reread is I get to kind of pay attention and catch these things more. Um, But Rowling does a lot of this stuff really, really well. And just a great, uh, this is a chapter after that exciting action chapter. This is just pretty much all dialogue, but it's all just like critical Big time world building. And we really learn Snape's interpretation of the events uh, that happened in the past isn't necessarily accurate. That it doesn't look like it was actually James's idea to play a trick on Snape that could have killed Snape and then James got cold feet as Snape presented it to Harry. It's actually Sirius Black just didn't like Snape, got tired of him snooping around and basically kind of trying to catch them at something to get them expelled. You know, being kind of like how Draco Malfoy sort of acts from time to time with Harry and his friends. And it was Sirius who did this to him. So, But James found out about it and risked his own life to go in there and pull Snape out away from the werewolf in time for Snape not to get bitten or killed. And, but Snape did see that it was actually Lupin. So Snape's interpretation of it is all three of them played this trick on him. And it was Lupin did it to him, and James did it to him, and Sirius did it to him. When it looks like, according to Lupin's version, that it was kind of all Sirius's idea, then Sirius just said, the hell with it, I'm going to do it to him, he deserves it. And that it was James actually who, who... upon finding out about it, stopped it. Which actually puts James in a better light than I was looking at James earlier in the book. Because from just Snape's point of view, James looks like a real bastard, like a not, not, not a nice person at all. But here, from Lupin's perspective, James risked his own life, even for someone he couldn't stand, because James was honorable. And which one of these is correct? Are... Is Snape 100% wrong and Lupin 100% right? Or is there some middle ground there and this is just how these two men view James in this moment? So Rowling, I don't think, clarifies. I mean, I suppose you can just take Lupin at his word that James didn't have anything to do with it, but you never know. We don't really know. So I, I still think there's James has a bit of both in him which we kind of saw in Harry in the last chapter, the previous chapter, where Harry wanted to kill Sirius Black. And I think James had some of that in himself as well, but at least this puts James in a better light, if we take Lupin's perspective. Just as he finishes saying all this, we hear a voice, and it's Snape takes off the invisibility cloak, and he's got his wand out. And that's how the chapter ends. So Snape knew about how to get how to disable the Whomping Willow because Sirius had told him how to do it, to send him down that tunnel to be end up startled by the werewolf or whatever. And Harry, I think, when they were chasing after Ron earlier, must have dropped his invisibility cloak. And Snape obviously must have been snooping around and found it and followed them. 
and this is where we're at now, and this is how the chapter ends. So now it's on to the next chapter. Chapter 19, The Servant of Lord Voldemort. So Snape wraps Lupin up in snake-like cords, like ties up his mouth, knocks him to the ground so Lupin can't talk. And Hermione, being who she is, with her mind all or always engaged and thinking, asks wouldn't it be best to just hear everybody out and Snape however is just unhinged at this point and we get another really interesting look at Snape here it's all those years of mistreatment from James from Sirius from Lupin you know Remus uh, from Peter Pettigrew it all just boils over here and Snape's kind of a bit mad at this point and not mad as an angry but mad as in kind of delusional and deranged and Harry takes a stand, though, and won't let them leave, won't take, let Snape take Lupin and Black, because Black will be turned over to the Dementor for the Dementor's kiss, and Lupin will at the very least be expelled and probably also turned over to the Dementors. And Harry stands in his way. And the last minute Harry goes to do is like Expelliarmus or whatever to disarm him. And doesn't realize that Hermione and Ron have the same idea. So all three hit Snape with an over-exuberant spell at the same time, which flings Snape across the room and smacks him into the wall and knocks him unconscious. And we learn some more here now. We get to finally because I get to start talking again. And we learn more about Crookshanks. And Crookshanks is just a cat. But Crookshanks could tell that Scabbers wasn't really a rat. And then when Sirius Black was showing up as the dog, Crookshanks could tell he wasn't really a dog. But in dog form, Sirius was able to communicate with Crookshanks and earn Crookshanks' trust. So now we know that Crookshanks was going after Scabbers specifically now because he was trying to capture Scabbers to bring Scabbers to the dog. So serious. Now, initially in the store and Diagon Alley, it might have just been a cat chasing a rat. But Crookshanks was never really able to get Scabbers. And we learn here that Scabbers probably just bit himself to leave blood to basically kind of frame Crookshanks <laughs> and then go and hide where he was hiding in Hagrid's place. And we learn, though, that once Sirius had Crookshanks' trust, it was Crookshanks who also stole Neville's passwords and gave them to Sirius Black so Sirius Black can get in, which now shows us why Crookshank is so protective of Sirius Black because they've been kind of working together. And what's interesting here is we learn that it was Sirius Black's idea to have the Potter switch the secret keeper role over to Peter Pettigrew. Because Harry is hearing all this stuff, but he's like, you were the secret keeper. It was still you. You were the only one who could have betrayed them. And this is, like I said, when Black tells them that, no, I, I convinced them to have Peter be the secret keeper. Cause, yeah. And we learn later in the chapter that it's because Voldemort would never suspect someone as weak and spineless... <laughs> as Peter to be the secret keeper because Sirius again didn't know that Peter had was already spying on them for Voldemort had already meant to betray them so Sirius just feels like it's all his own fault because he gave Voldemort the key to be able to get at and kill the Potters so he feels like it's all his fault regardless and we learn now the reason after all these years why Sirius Black broke out of Azkaban is the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, went to visit him during the summer and or at the start of the summer and let Sirius Black look at the Daily Prophet. He gave him the newspaper and in the newspaper was that picture of the Weasley family in Egypt that I think Harry had seen earlier in the book as well and recognized Scabbers, recognized Peter Pettigrew right away because that was Peter Pettigrew's animagus form and saw 
the reference that Harry was at Hogwarts and the we Ron would be returning to Hogwarts after the summer. And it's just funny how, you know, just one casual little thing can set off a chain reaction. Had Sirius not seen that paper, he'd still be sitting in Azkaban. And Harry would be in a lot more danger than he is now. And now Peter hasn't done anything to Harry all this time because, as far as Peter knows, Voldemort was defeated and vanquished and hasn't risen up. Um, but once word of Voldemort actually beginning to return, beginning to regain power, if that really reached Peter's ears as a real thing, then Harry's life would be imperiled. And Peter would rat Harry out immediately. I guess no pun intended. And Harry finally, in the, while, in the middle of all this telling, comes to believe Sirius. And part of it is Sirius mentions that he watched Harry win the Quidditch Cup and how good he is, and he's just as good as his father. And I think that's kind of seeing that Sirius Black and un realizing that those memories of James were real and his feelings towards James as his best friend were real kind of helps Harry realize that Black is telling the truth. And then Lupin and Sirius are like, all right, let's basically, let's kill this guy. <laughs> but what's interesting here, though, is um, as all these tensions are building, it's Hermione who kind of rises to the occasion because Lupin and Black and Peter are all running on emotion. Harry's running on emotion. Ron is running on emotion. And Hermione kind of steps up because she needs to think things through. She needs data. She needs information. So she just kind of like, excuse me, Mr. Black, you know, I have a couple of questions, which kind of like throws everyone off. And she's just sort of like diffuses that moment where they all have to start think, using their brain again. And through that telling is when Harry finally comes to believe Sirius and all that stuff. But then we get back to the point where they're just going to kill Peter Pettigrew at this point. And Harry, interestingly enough, steps up and says no. That Peter needs to go to Azkaban. That's what he deserves. And he doesn't believe that his father would have wanted his two best friends to become killers. Especially over someone like Peter Pettigrew. So they agree. And they're going to bring him to the back to the castle, turn him over to Dumbledore, and then let the law, if you will, take care of things. So they tie Peter up. They kind of put these shackles on him, and Lupin and Ron kind of take him. They do this sort of spell, which sort of levitates a still unconscious Snape. So Snape can kind of just float along behind them. And they follow Crookshanks out the door, and they're going to make their way back to Hogwarts. And that's where the chapter ends. Chapter 20, The Dementor's Kiss. Now, this is a really short chapter. I think it's only about nine pages. Two of these five chapters are only about that length. Um, but again, a lot happens here. And we have this whole group. Crookshank is leading the way. And Ron is being held up and because his leg is broken and Peter Pettigrew is sort of shackled to them on either side and S uh, Snape is kind of just floating in the air and led by Sirius Black with Snape's own wand and they're making their way back through the tunnel and I got a kick out of Sirius not really caring that Snape's head kept bouncing off the top of the tunnel <laughs> Because Sirius, you know, he just doesn't seem to care about those kind of things. And, um, but a really touching moment here is because Sirius reaches out to Harry and says, you know, I'm your godfather. And once Peter's turned over to the authorities, my name will be cleared and you can come live with me. Which, and at first he thinks Harry doesn't want to, but then Harry's like, are you kidding me? Of course. He, you know, and this opens up a whole new world of possibilities for Harry. Like, he sees in this moment, like, his whole life is going to change. And we get to see uh, serious smiles, like, a real smile for the first time. And Harry sees, like, 
who Sirius Black really is and what he would look like had he not spent the last 12 years tormented in Azkaban. Uh, but it's out of the tunnel into the, the school grounds to make their way. And lo and behold, the clouds part and it's a full moon. And Snape had mentioned earlier that Lupin hadn't taken his potion. So Lupin transforms into the werewolf. Sirius transforms into his the hound that he has, this black hound, to kind of like, and he attacks the werewolf and drags him away from the kids because he's trying to protect the, you know, Harry and Hermione and Ron uh, from being killed. And of course, Peter Pettigrew takes this moment, grabs Lupin's discarded wand, and has it just long enough to get out of his shackles, and then he transforms and into scabbers and scampers off again. But we can hear Sirius Black being like hurt, and after checking Ron, because Ron gets knocked unconscious in that moment, so after checking, make sure Ron's okay, because um, Peter Pettigrew did some sort of spell to him to kind of make him unconscious. They decide Harry and Hermione run after Sirius Black, and what they discover is Black is back in human form and the Dementors have closed in and they're coming to give him the Dementors kiss and then they close in on Harry and Hermione as well and try as he might Harry can't produce a real Patronus he's only able to just do that sort of little silvery wisp of a light Hermione can't do it at all either and she's finally overwhelmed by so many Dementors and she passes out and then Harry passes out but as he's passing out he can see suddenly a real full-blown Patronus coming from somewhere nearby that starting to drive the Dementors away. And he sees it almost like a... He can't tell what it is. It's sort of unicorn-like. He can't really see it because he's so like barely, barely conscious at this point. And all he can see is that it goes over to someone and he just has just enough like wherewithal to know that this is someone who looks familiar, and then he passes out, and that's where the chapter ends. Really quick, but again, it's a big, big moment. And this is where my reading for this week ends, <laughs> which is right at a super exciting cliffhanging moment, which makes me want to just keep reading, but I'm not going to. We only have two chapters next week. Um, Hermione's Secret, where we finally get the reveal with Hermione and what's been going on with her and just the whole finale of how this all plays out the way it does. And then Owl's Post again is the last chapter. And then I also start in the first three chapters of The Goblet of Fire next week. So thoughts on these chapters overall. First, I want to hear from you in the comments what you thought of these chapters, particularly we get all these reveals uh, that we get here. We get more of the story with what happened between James and Lupin and, and Sirius and Snape and the trick that they were playing. And we learn now that Snape's version of it isn't really accurate either. And, but the fact that these kids, well, or these people, when they were kids, created the Marauder's Map, and they are Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, which I completely forgot about that part. Um, from because again i've only read this book once prior to this and i don't remember if that was even mentioned in the movie that um uh, i don't remember lupin mentioning it but again it's it's been a while since i've seen the third movie so i'd have to when i would do go back and watch these movies again uh, i'm curious to see the difference and even here from what i remember the movie is very different because peter kind of escapes again inside the shrieking shack um, in the book, he they bring him all the way out to the school grounds where he finally gets away. So the movie, you know, movies do that, though. They kind of change things, shorten things up, move things around to just make it play and film better. Lots of really cool moments here. And there's been a lot building up to these scenes. And this is still, in its own way, as action-packed as it is, it's all still set up for this next chapter that I'm going to be reading next week which I wish it was already next week so I can finish this book because I'm absolutely loving this book. This was my favorite of the seven books when I did my original read. 
and it's firmly planted at the top so far of these first three. And the next four books have their work cut out for them to try to knock this out of the top spot. But I'm really, really curious to see. I'm especially curious about The Order of Phoenix because as far as the books go, that's probably my one of my lower-ranked books in the series. Actually, one of my favorite of the films. And there are a lot of things that I really, really like in that book, but there was just one section of it that just seemed to just drag on a little too long, it was just a little too monotonous. So I'm really, really curious to see how that book's going to read to me this time around, actually taking my time and going through it a few chapters at a time. Because again, I read that book in two days, originally. But a really great set of chapters here from pro, um, from them getting through their finals, Professor Trelawney having a real like vision, a real prediction, and all the reveals here of what's been going on and who the real culprit was and... It, I love this book because it's it's so personal to Harry. Uh, big, big difference between this and the first two. I mean, the first two are personal to a degree, but this is his family. This is his parents. This is his godfather, who he thought there was this, like, deep betrayal. So it really um, elevates the stakes and makes it, just to a reader, that much more personal than kind of going up against two iterations of this sort of nebulous sort of Voldemort character, like the first two books. This is very visceral and very, like, like deeply, deeply felt stuff for Harry, far more than those, which were just kind of on a different level. But I want to hear from you as well. What are your thoughts on these chapters? And I also I want to hear your thoughts on the description of the Dementor when... He closes in on Harry, and Harry's sort of flopping over, but then the Dementor pulls his hood off, and he's got this sort of gray skin, but there's no eyes at all. There's just this mouth, and it lifts Harry's head up and then starts sucking. And you wonder, are they going to try to give Harry the Dementor's kiss here too? You know, are they acting on somebody else's orders, not just the Ministry's? It's hard to tell with these Dementors what their um, what they really want and how can you control them who who controls them really but there's I don't know if that's explained anywhere do they have a boss <laughs> or is it just they're sort of given guidelines and then they do whatever they want in those guidelines and do they keep their actions limited because of the power of Dumbledore I don't know I'm curious so I'd like to hear if you know more about this stuff than me. Feel free to let me know in the comments. A great set of chapters, lots of action, lots of um, historical reveals, lots of learning about you know the earlier generation, and interesting things here about how people view uh, experiences that they were all part of and Snape's view of things, and Lupin's view of things, and Sirius Black's view of things. They're all so different from each other, even though all, they were all happening to all three, plus James, all at that same time. So it's funny how we recollect things. And I think a lot of it has to do with our own emotional state at the time uh, impacts how we record memories in our mind. And then our emotional state in the future, I think, impacts how we play those memories back. And it's really interesting to see just this like, kind of disparity between like, memories of people who went through the same events. Another question I have is, okay, we know when a wizard like, commits murder or does something egregious or heinous, they go to Azkaban. But are there any other wizarding jails? I mean... What do you do with those people? Like, what if a wizard just steals, like, somebody's car or a loaf of bread or something? I mean, I can't imagine you get sent to prison or to Azkaban for stealing a loaf of bread. Hey, what are you in here, Tom? Well, I killed three wizards. What are you in here for, Frank? Well, I stole two loaves of bread. I mean, seems a little, like, doesn't seem to fit. So I'm just curious. Is there any mention of 
I know there's the Ministry of Magic, and they have, like, Harry will later have his sort of little Inquisition sort of trial thing. But, I mean, not everyone could be sent to Azkaban for doing something wrong. So what other recourse is there? So if anyone knows of that as well, if you're aware of that, please let me know in the comments. Just things that pop into my head while I'm reading this stuff. And so once again, next week are the last two chapters. Chapters 21 and 22, Hermione's Secret and Owl Post again. And then the first three chapters of Goblet of Fire, The Riddle House, The Scar, and The Invitation. And I am almost done with this book. Two more chapters to go. Super excited. Absolutely loving it again, like I've mentioned before. I have my playlist here. Uh, if you haven't seen any of the earlier videos in this series, uh, they're all here in my playlist, plus a couple of other uh, small little videos as well uh, for this whole content. I, I also have videos again on Wednesdays and Fridays. Fridays is usually my Friday reads, kind of recapping what I've been reading throughout the week, what I'm going to be reading over the weekend. And Wednesdays is kind of a wide open category for me. Um, like and subscribe. Hope to see you in the comments. Um, I hope to see you'll see me in the comments in your videos if you're a, a booktuber yourself. If not, then you just if you just watch, please. Um, I love to interact and I love um, feedback and all those things. So. I am Charles of Sir Booksage. Happy reading.